So what you see on the screen is a System 360 IBM machine. If you haven't seen this, it's because you don't work somewhere awesome enough yet, because this is a top of the line computer. This thing is amazing. It has the best specs you could possibly imagine, right? This thing has 64 kilobytes of RAM. You've probably never experienced that much amount of RAM in your life. This thing is incredible. Or it was in 1970. That's when you could buy this thing. And at the time, it was pretty impressive. But it would cost you a nice $5 million to buy, which if you adjust for inflation, is $40 million today. And if you compare that to the iPhone 13, it's actually quite incredible what has happened in the last 50 years, right? We have an iPhone 13 that has so much more performance than this top of the line server, and it only costs $800 compared to the 40 million that this other one would cost you. And this is a big deal because if you learn anything about running a business, it's that you optimize your most expensive resource. Now in 1970, if you were to spend five million on this IBM System 360, that would most definitely be your most expensive resource. And so it would make sense that you would need to take the time to optimize everything you ran on that computer so that you could optimize all the things that you can use that computer for. However, today, the computer is no longer the most expensive resource. It costs $800, fits in your pocket, or your laptop costs $3,000 $3, maybe, maybe $5,000 if you spec it out a lot. And that laptop, which will last you a long time, is still really cheap compared to you. You, the developer, are now the most expensive resource. And so today, as we work through software, we should still optimize our code, we should still make it more performant, but you matter so much more than the computer. And as your dad probably told you, or dad say everywhere, whenever you do any woodworking project, you always measure twice and cut once. And how this applies to computers is when we have performance that we need to change, and we have these different things we want to fix, before we go and just fix them, we need to measure. For example, if you were running a big heavy workload on your computer, and you said, I should probably optimize this, but you really had no idea if you needed to, you might be wasting your time. But if you see the CPU start to spike at 100%, things start to get really slow, then you say, okay, I have an issue, I need to fix it. And similarly, as you try to improve yourself and improve your dev teams, you should not just willy-nilly start trying to work on things. You should measure first. And there's an organization called the DevOps Research and Assessment Organization, not to be confused with a friendly cartoon. And they have a set of metrics. If you've ever read the book Accelerate, it's the same metrics in Accelerate, which is they measure deployment frequency, error rate, lead time, and mean time to recovery, which is essentially how often do you deploy per dev per day um, and they say that these are kind of the guidelines of what a high-performing team does. Are you deploying at least once per dev per day? It's actually pretty hard to get to. Um, do you have less than 15% errors when you deploy? Can you get your commit to production in less than an hour? And when you have production issues, can you fix them in less than an hour? So these are kind of your metrics. And if you're not hitting these, you have work to do. And if you are hitting these, well, please teach the rest of us because these are actually really hard to get to. So the first thing about computer science that I want to talk about is probably the biggest thing you ever talk about in computer science, which is big O. If you don't know what big O is, it's the idea that you calculate the cost of an algorithm over time based on your input size. So as I give an algorithm more and more data, does it get slower and slower? Does it stay about the same or faster? To give you an idea, I got really sick of using the NPM provided version of is even, right? Because security reasons. So I wrote my own. Um, this is my own is even function. It's pretty great. Um, 
every time I have a number, I just flip a bit, even or odd, you know, up until the number. Um, but what this tells you is the input size, so we think of the number as the input size. If I were to run this for the number four, it would run really fast. But if I were to run this for the number four trillion, this would actually take a long time. And that's an example of big O and how the growth of this function scales over time. And so, if you really think about this, this algorithm here, what's going on is that we are using CPU cycles on things that aren't actually needed. It's kind of a waste because we have math and math can tell us how to do this faster. But how this applies to you is that you need to reduce the things that you work on that are not actually needed. There are so many things in your workflow, in your deployment process, et cetera, that you spend time on that ultimately is not actually needed and is not moving the needle. This is called toil. And as you eliminate toil, you will notice that your effective ability to write code and actually ship important things to customers will improve. There's a lot of things that we do day to day that can constitute as toil. The first one any developer will jump to is probably meetings, right? Especially meetings that could have been an email. Those are definitely toil. But also just working on things that we don't need. If your deployment process or any part of your process really requires following a doc, copy and pasting a bunch of commands, and you find yourself doing that every day or every week, that is toil. Those are things that you are repetitively doing that can be automated. And as you stop doing those things, it opens up a world of being more optimal on the time that you can spend. Um, in the book, The Phoenix Project, there's a quote that says, improving daily work is more important than doing daily work. Um, quick story here, I was doing Advent to Code, and I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's like a bunch of fun little code challenges that count down to Christmas in December. And there was one problem that came up where the brute force solution was pretty slow. And so I was doing Advent of Code, and I started running it, and I did the brute source solution, started running the code, and it just sat there and sat there and sat there. And then I realized, okay, this is going to take forever. So I had to take about an hour. I stopped, I took about an hour, I tried to come up with a more optimal solution, and then I got an, inst an instant answer. My friend, however, he said, oh, this is gonna take a while, I'm just gonna go to bed. So he just went to bed, let the computer run, work on it, woke up the next morning and it was done. So he put in way less work to like, get to the optimal solution, which for this situation was probably the right thing to do. I spent an extra hour. But if we were to do this over and over and over again, I actually saved a lot more time by coming up with the more optimal solution. So the how, how that applies to us day to day is that if our daily work is getting worse over time, then our ability to deliver is getting worse over time. So we need to take time to shorten that big O function of our daily work in order to improve our own output and our our ability to ship what's important to our users. So the next computer science topic I want to talk about is CPU architecture. This is a picture of two CPUs. So it's a two core CPU, and each, each core has two threads. And CPUs have caches. They have multiple levels of caches, three levels of caches of data before they get to RAM. And as a CPU reads from RAM, the objects that it reads more often, it puts into multiple layers of caches. Well, your L1 cache, the first level of caching, is actually 100 times faster than RAM. So your computer is able to read these objects out of the L1 cache way faster than it can read it from RAM. So if you were to write a low-level program that was having memory issues, that was potentially where the bottleneck was RAM, you could optimize it by reducing the amount of objects that the CPU needs to interact with in order to encourage your objects to stay on the L1 cache. And that dramatically increases your runtime because your CPU has less lookup to do because it's always on the cache. And the idea here is really that we ourselves as humans 
are like, sorry, are like the CPU. We have an L1 cache. We have an L3 cache. We have RAM. We have long-term memory and short-term memory. And as we try to comprehend a code base, and as we try to understand the problem that we're dealing with, it takes longer and longer for us to load more and more things into our memory. So as we try to shorten those things and try to shrink those things, then the context that we have to load into our brain goes down and we're able to understand what we're working on way better. And so we can shrink the things that we're working on and try to reduce that cognitive load. One of my favorite ways to reduce cognitive load is to write tests. And that doesn't reduce your cognitive load, but it does reduce the cognitive load of the next person to come along because all the constraints that they would otherwise have to think about are now codified for them, so the tests can do the thinking for them. Uh, TypeScript is one of the things that people love, and the reason they love it is because it's reducing their cognitive load. The ability to understand what's going on, the ability to understand how a function operates, how an object works, when it's typed, when it's there, when it's when you get clear errors about misusing it, it's reducing the cognitive load and what you have to understand in order to do it. So the next thing I want to talk about is parallelization or asynchronous and synchronous. So this is a function that reads a file from the system. And I have a question for you, which is, should this be asynchronous as I wrote it, or should it be synchronous? The answer is probably asynchronous because reading from the file is slow. And as you read the file, your CPU can now go on to do other things while waiting for the contents of that file to come back. But here's another, here's another function. This is the Fibonacci sequence. It's recursive. It's, your CPU will hate it. Um, and basically, I wrote it asynchronously. And every time you go to make a calculation, you just call the function again twice. Should this be asynchronous or synchronous? The answer is synchronous, because if you do this asynchronous, your CPU is actually doing twice the amount of work. Every time you have that await, you're actually taking the function and putting it on the event loop. And then when it gets off the event loop, it's putting it back onto the call stack. So because this is a CPU intensive with zero IO, this is actually twice the amount of work to do asynchronously than to do synchronously. And the point here is that some things we do need to be synchronous. But other things we do need to be asynchronous. There's no obvious solution for all scenarios. How this relates to the CPU is if you have multiple processes on a single CPU, you'll see in this diagram that we're switching between process one to process two. A CPU can't actually run two things at the same time. So what it does is it shares that by t stopping execution of one and then saves the state and then it loads the execution of the next thing. You'll notice that this constant back and forth and saving of reloading state is actually wasting time. So in order to optimize one of these processes, the easiest solution is you delete the other process. Make this CPU work on only one process. This is why if you run web servers, the recommendation is you keep the amount of processes the same as the number of cores. It reduces the amount of sw switching that you have to do. This is called context switching. And it's something that we too as humans have to deal with all the time. We context switch between various tasks. You're in the middle of writing something and then your coworker says, hey, I need you to code review this. Or hey, I need you to look into this solution. Or hey, you have a meeting that's about to happen right now. We need to try to reduce those things, reduce that context switching. Get into flow. Flow is so important. It is a way for you to think about code at a deeper level and truly understand what's going on in your system. Earlier, we talked about cognitive load. And the only way to truly get things into your brain is to have time to do so. So try to reduce how much time you're interrupted. I'm sure we've all had situations like this, where you're deep in thought, you're working on something, you're finally getting it through, you have this like complex thing in your brain and you think you're finally getting to a solution. Someone comes to you and is like, hey, by the way, I need your help. And then that whole thing disappears. And guess what? If you were to go back to this task, you now have to do that all over again. And that is a huge amount of waste. In fact, there's been research done about how much waste happens when you context switch. And the trends in cognitive sciences has said that if you have five sim simultaneous projects that you're working on, you're likely going to spend 30, uh, sorry, 70% of that time 
just context switching. And so the amount of time of actually getting work done is going to go way down as you have multiple processes. So if you are a manager, the number one thing you can do to help your team is make sure that there is only one work in progress, only one thing, as much as possible. But also just reduce the amount of simultaneous projects because that can be a huge waste. So the last computer science topic I want to talk about is just the cost of various operations and how it relates to I.O. So CPU is so incredibly fast that I actually found this slide really hard to talk about and comprehend. So instead, I adjusted the time scale to human time. So humans like fastest time scale is a second, right? So let's just pretend that a CPU takes one second. If a CPU cycle was one second, then going to RAM is six minutes. That's how much slower reading RAM is compared to the CPU. But sending a single packet from San Francisco to New York would be four years. And that doesn't even talk about the response back from that packet. So if you wanted a request and a response, that would be eight years in comparison to this human scale time of how fast that CPU is, right? CPUs are fast, okay? So IO is slow. IO is super slow. And so we avoid it as much as we can. It is always the bottleneck in your application. However, we need it. Right? If there wasn't a back end on your front end, then your users wouldn't be able to have state across each other. Right? We need IO, we need communication for consistency. But because of that, we've come up with multiple algorithms and things that help us have reduced CPU cycle, sorry, help us have reduced IO while still having improved consistency. Things like leader election allow a single service to know that it's in charge so that you actually reduce the amount of communication overall. And this applies to us in our workplace. Communication is expensive. It is the bottleneck in your organization. And the more you can reduce communication, the better you will be able to produce useful things. However, just like communication on the computer, it's needed. We need communication because without it, we wouldn't be consistent and we wouldn't be able to make the impact that we need, right? We have coworkers for a reason, we still need to communicate with them. But we need to look for ways to reduce that communication. A common way would be, do you have a clear owner for a specific error or a specific component? Because if you don't, it can potentially cause this whole issue where your whole organization is trying to debate who should own this, who should fix this. But if there's a clear owner, then that communication just goes away. So we talked about the door metrics of how you measure. Measure first. You don't know how you need to change until you measure, so measure first. And then second, you can improve. You can reduce your toil, your cognitive load, your context switching, and your needless communication. And there's a lot here and a lot for you to do, and you could probably go into these topics for years and still make improvements. So if I could make one suggestion of one thing you should do today, just one thing if you just want to make one change, it's based on this slide. And this is, if we have a large deployment, maybe this represents multiple commits, multiple things. And a small deployment, which probably represents one commit and just one thing. You'll notice that the toil is, is painful, meaning if I have pro human processes in my deployment, that's going to be so painful to do on just one commit, which will actually force me to fix that toil. And the cognitive load to understand that change goes way down. Right? The pull request becomes so easy to read. It's just two lines of code or 10. It's really easy. Um, it's, I'm less likely to have to context switch while I'm working on this feature because it's so small. Right? I make my change, I push it to prod, it gets deployed, boom, I'm done, now I can move on to something else. Versus if I have this large deployment, it's like, oh, I'm not going to see that deployed for like four days, so I have to context switch, do something else, now there's a bug in production. I have to recontext switch everything I just did because it got deployed too late. And then there's going to be less back and forth between people trying to figure out what broke and what did. So the one trick that will probably do all of these at the same time is ship smaller batches. That is your takeaway if you don't do anything else. Try to ship as small as you can, as frequently as you can. And all the pains that you find along that road, fix them. Don't let them encourage you to ship lots of things together. Ship as small as you can, as frequently as you can. Thank you.